In the last two days, we had done a lot of history. I shared a lot about what happened from the time of John Huss in the Czech Republic and then his uh, execution and how 100 years later Martin Luther according to his prophecy came up and all that happened. Today I'm not going to do history. We need to get a little deeper into the subject. So suppose water is boiling in the kettle and someone asks why is the water boiling? What is the answer? There are three answers. The first answer is water is boiling because it is in a transitionary phase of being converted from water to gas or vapor. That is a scientific answer but there is a simplistic answer and it is because I turned the kettle on. That's why the water is boiling. But there is an even better answer, the real answer. The water is boiling because I'm going to make you a lovely cup of tea. That is the proper answer. Why did Jesus die for you? There are so many answers people can give. Every Christian appreciates the death of Jesus. But do we realize that there are different levels in which we understand it? Some only a scientific answer, maybe all the medical details and, you know, he died like this. Some can give a simplistic answer. Jesus died to save me from sin. That's the answer everybody knows. Everybody, all of us say, Jesus, thank you. Through our songs, in our prayers, we say, thank you for dying for me. And we may be sincere in that too. So Jesus died for me. I appreciate it and then after that I work out my own way of salvation. We want the real answer. Do we understand the gospel? I have been in gospel meetings where a person has been specially chosen to testify and the testimony goes like this. Praise the Lord, I was born in a Hindu family as I grew up in my teenage, I had the company of some wrong friends and I began to drink and take drugs. I became very depressed. Things went really wrong. I contemplated suicide. One night I was crying and then a white figure appeared and said, I love you. I died for you. And so I went to church and I decided to be a Christian. And I really thank God for all the deep doctrines I'm learning, praise the Lord. That's not the gospel. But I was fooled at that time. If there was a testimony like this, I would say, please, next meeting you testify. Because I thought that the testimony is so persuasive. And for me, Christianity meant you are accepting God. You are accepting Christ. So to make you accept Christ, I needed some, some technique to persuade you, to convict you, to change you. So a testimony like this, you testify. Maybe your testimony will touch their heart. So in other words, I was using psychology, hoping that you will be touched, you will be converted. But you know how wrong, it is a completely wrong understanding of salvation. Because we all say, I've accepted Jesus. And we think that is salvation. I'm going to make an important statement. And I want you to take it into your heart. The gospel is not about you accepting God. But it is about God accepting you. There is a depth in that that you will not understand now, but by the end of the week you will. It's all about God accepting you. And that is the essence of justification. But we've turned it the other way. I have decided to accept Jesus as my savior. Justification is that one thing that Martin Luther desperately needed. 
and was desperately seeking night and day. He wanted acceptance. He was always living under the wrath of God, under a cloud of guilt and fear, constantly feeling God was rejecting him. So he was all the time wanting to be accepted. What he was seeking was justification. Why is the water boiling? We don't need the science. We need the cup of tea. Why did Jesus die for me? We don't need the science. Because I am a wretched sinner. I am heading straight for hell and there is absolutely nothing I can do to save myself. And so Jesus died to save me. Did you understand that? I'm sure you'll say yes. But I'll say no. Maybe in a certain sense, yes. But in a bigger sense, you did not understand it. I just said, because you are a wretched sinner heading for hell, and there's no way you can save yourself, and so Jesus came to save you. You tell me you understood it. I am saying you did not. Because how you understand it is in your head. You understood it in your head as a fact. There are many facts we know. We know that fire burns. We know that gravity pulls downwards. But are these facts precious to you? Do you thank God, Lord? I thank you, Lord, because gravity is pulling me downwards. No, they are facts you know. You don't personally relate to them. You don't thank God for them. You're not so moved by these facts that you go around starting a movement, a prevention of fire society or an anti-gravity club. No, these are facts, but they don't mean anything to you. And that's what has happened about the gospel facts. We say we understand. I am a sinner heading for hell. No, you don't. You never understood it. You know it as a fact. But let me tell you this. The day you deeply, truly, and personally know your wretchedness, your depravity, and you know for yourself that you're going to hell. And you know there is nothing you can do about it. That is the day you will understand justification by faith alone. Without that, you're only going to gain more knowledge. This week will be more knowledge for you. This topic, justification by faith alone, I am telling you, Three or four years ago, I wouldn't have understood it properly. There are a lot of things just accumulating in our heads and we will never understand deep in our hearts these truths if it's only in our head. Because this is not a doctrine for you to know, but it's a truth for you to embrace like, like oxygen. You, you have to embrace it. The tragedy of the modern church is that we've almost completely lost this teaching. The gospel, if it is all the time in your head and not in your heart, that's like an ectopic pregnancy. You will never develop into a proper Christian. So pray like I prayed. I said, God, I want to see my depravity. I want to know my wretchedness. Because all these people who really understood the gospel, they first understood their depravity. Paul cried out, O oh, wretched man that I am. Martin Luther, John Wesley, St. Augustine, all of them who really made an impression for God, they first understood their own state and they were really depressed about it. They were began to cry. So say, Lord, show me what hell is like, that I might know what you are saving me from. I was terrified when God began to show me 
I think it's about four years ago, one morning, I felt a very dark presence. When I wake up those days, I didn't often feel God's presence. But one day I felt a very dark presence in my room. I felt really scared. I couldn't pray and fight it. And that is when God told me, start the prayer circle on Tuesday. And those of you who participated, it was such a blessing for us at that time. For me, it really delivered me because this experience I had with this dark presence, it made me realize if just some dark presence around me is like this, what is hell going to be? It was terrifying. By all this, I understood what God has saved me from. Then I personally understood forgiveness. I'll say knowing it in your head as a fact is different from understanding with your heart. I understood justification. I understood the cancellation of my debt. I understood being reconciled to the Father. All these things, maybe they are all facts in your head, but please pray and tell God, make this something that I can understand. I didn't understand these things because I'm good or better than you. I understood it because God made me realize how wretched and sinful I am. Now Jesus came and he died on the cross for us. And that's the gospel. That is the whole atonement. Now there is a question. How are all the benefits of the atonement like forgiveness and reconciliation and healing and debt cancellation and propitiation, expiation, all that we learn. How are those blessings transferred to an individual? Imagine your friend has been collecting some very precious books for you. He's living very, very far away on an island and there is no transport. He's, he's there and there's no way for you to go to him either. He says, I'm collecting these books for you. You say, oh, thank you. And he collects and collects and he says, I've got about 40 books now. The question is, what's the point of collecting it on that island? How is he now going to transfer it to you? There it's a logistical problem. Now, when you think of the atonement, Jesus died on Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary is about 5,500 kilometers from here. But the problem is not the distance. The problem is Jesus died 2,000 years ago. How are the blessings of the cross transferred to an individual, appropriated to an individual 2,000 years later? How can these blessings be yours? That's the question. And so, writing to the Galatians, Paul makes it very clear. Everything comes to us by faith alone. I must admit, I haven't fully grasped it. I've been meditating night and day till it works in my head in my sleep. But some of these concepts are deep and they have to really be understood. So I'm trying my best to go slow. This aspect of the gospel, justification by faith alone, is the most essential, fundamental part of the gospel. If the gospel is like a door, then this is like the hinge on which the door swings. If the hinge is gone, the door collapses and you will never be able to enter that door. And that is why you find that Paul is very zealous concerning the gospel and not about other teachings so much. Do you ever find Paul spending pages in the Bible defending the speaking in tongues? Do you find Paul defending divine healing? He talks about things here and there. But when it comes to the gospel, he's ready to defend it with his life. For when he wrote to the Galatians, realizing that their minds had been corrupted, what a zeal he had. He said, if anybody corrupts you and takes you away from the gospel, preaches another gospel to you, let him be anathema. Meaning, let him be cursed. His denunciation is unmistakable. Anyone, he says, to clarify, anybody, 
even if it is an angel from heaven or an apostle, a preacher, anybody, even I, he said, anyone who preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed. That is a zeal that Paul had. Not even a modicum, a tiny amount of the message should be altered. Today, let me define justification by faith. And we will go into details slowly. I'm going to define it in two parts. One, justification by faith, and then justification by faith alone. Now, God made it very easy for me because I don't have to say it. It is there in the Bible as two clear verses. And for me, I would say I really, 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 really thank God for what he taught me personally in the last two years and whatever he showed, because I realized this is a verse that I struggled with all my life. I could not understand. And that is Galatians chapter 3. Verse 6. Galatians 3, 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. All my life I stumbled at this verse. It made no sense. But when I discovered the meaning, the definition of justified by faith, I was speechless. Abraham believed God and it. What is it? His faith. His faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Other translations say his faith was credited to him, reckoned to him, imputed to him for righteousness. So the crucial, critical word here is believe. It is by faith. When the guilty sinner believes in Jesus, then God declares that guilty sinner to be righteous before him. I'm making statements now. There's a lot in this that I will explain and probably the deepest part of it will be on Good Friday. When the guilty sinner believes in Jesus Christ, in his atoning death, then God justifies that same guilty sinner. Now that righteousness of God becomes the possession of the sinner. That's the point that Luther screamed. Luther was terrified of righteousness. He was terrified of that word justice. And suddenly he realized, when I'm justified, that justice becomes mine. And God now counts me just. See, ectopic pregnancy is going on. All facts in the head. I really wish it can get into our hearts. I wish really this truth can go. Because Luther didn't just write notes. He, didn't just, he was like a madman when he discovered this. And then in verse 7 we read how this justification is not for just one person, it is for us as well. Read verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Ah. So it is for us too. And verse 8, it's for the heathen. Even the heathen are justified by faith. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. See? Can you see that again and again? What is Paul saying? Through faith. It is through faith. It is through faith. I want you to stop and think about it. Through faith. Through faith. That's a constant message that Paul is speaking about. And Luther understood it. But for us, it's only a fact. But we haven't got it personally. Now, I want to show you another verse which shows you it is only by faith. By faith alone, nothing else. Okay? Read Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. 
But to him that worketh not. Okay, but to him that worketh not, that means he is not doing anything. But believeth on him that justifieth. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. You see, clearly tells you it's not by works, it's not by anything you do, but just believing. That means by faith alone. These are the two verses about justification by faith alone, but there are many more verses. Now the question is, all right, brother, we believe about believing, but how to believe? Isn't that the big problem? There are many benefits of being brought up in the church, but there are also some drawbacks. And one is being able to believe. I couldn't believe anything. I couldn't believe in God. I couldn't believe in Jesus. I couldn't believe in the Holy Spirit. I couldn't believe anything. It was so hard. And I used to tell the Lord, how to believe? Is there a way to believe? Is there a method? How do I get this faith? Simple, believe. How do you get faith? You believe. That's the kind of answers you get. Then I realized, this faith is a gift from God. So, if you are going to pray, ask God, show me what my wretchedness, my depravity, show me what hell is like so that I may really appreciate my salvation. Secondly, give me faith to believe. Now, justification by faith alone is a, such an important truth that it is, I would say, one of Satan's main targets. And so there are two ways in which he will corrupt it. Justification is by faith alone. Faith alone. That's what Satan wants to change. So there are two ways in which he will change it. It's called faith plus. Can you guess the other? Faith minus. Okay, I'll explain that to you and I will finish. Faith plus means believing. Just believing in the death of Jesus is not enough. You must do some other thing to be justified. That is called faith plus. In other words, you are trying to earn your justification. You're trying to earn God's acceptance. I will give you a typical example and you will relate to it. Maybe some of you will relate to it. Okay, some of you have been attending all the prayers this week and maybe you're even fasting and you're seeking God for some need. If for even one moment you have thought that because I prayed faithfully and I attended all the meetings, therefore God must show mercy to me. That is the example of faith plus. Because you are trying to earn God's favor by doing something. It's a typical attitude that we are all guilty of. This is faith plus. Faith alone means only faith in Christ and I have nothing to offer. The church taught that the benefits of the cross, all the atonement and all that, it becomes yours through the administration of the sacraments, that is, like baptism or communion. It is through these things that you are finally saved. In fact, at the Council of Trent, they, Rome pronounced the same word, anathema, on anyone who says, the sinner is justified by faith alone. Rome, so this is a battle between Rome and the reformers. Rome is saying, if anybody says justification is by faith alone, let him be anathema. So this is what enraged Luther, just like Paul was enraged with what happened to the Galatians who were trying to be justified by works and faith. That is why when Luther finally established this doctrine, he called it sola fide, meaning only faith. And Luther made a shocking statement. It is so shocking that you may not believe it, but I'll just state it. This is what he said. A church will stand 
or fall based on its teaching of sola fide. And he said, without sola fide, the church will fall in one hour. The church may exist physically, but God will not be in the church that teaches faith plus. When it falls, great will be the fall of that church. Another man compared justification by faith as the giant atlas holding up the earth by its pillars. That's the picture, that's a mythical picture of the giant atlas holding up the earth. And if he only shrugs, the whole earth will collapse. And that is how justification of faith is. If even you adjust that truth a little, everything will collapse. Many of us, this is where I'm going to make it personal. Many of us are practicing faith plus without realizing it. We are doing good works. We are helping the poor. We are praying. We are paying our tithes. We are faithful in our ministries. We make sure we come in time. We are very punctual. We are very regular. And particularly, we have a thing that we don't wear jewelry. We don't wear makeup. Well, at least not that much. We are modest in everything. And so these are the things that we describe ourselves by. Now we think, because we do these things, God will accept us, justify us. Isn't that what Luther was trying to do all along? He was also trying, works and works and works, somehow trying, sleeping in the snow, beating himself. All the priests were doing it, and that's all he knew. We are constantly trying to earn God's favor by either doing good or being good. That is the old covenant. That's not the new covenant. It, that's why we're not understanding it. I want to say it again. We are not saved by good works. We are saved unto good works. That means after we are saved, there are good works. Let's read these verses. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto good works. So we are saved unto good works. And what are these good works? Which God hath before ordained. God has already ordained. That we should walk in them. Okay. Also read Titus chapter 3 verse 8. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14, we are not saved by the works of righteousness. But now you read chapter 3 verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God. Those who have believed in God, that is you already saved. Might be careful to maintain good works. Ah, you must be careful to maintain good works. The question is, so why do you do good works? You're not doing good works to win God's favor because that is faith plus. So why do you do good works? The only reason we do good things, say for example, you're coming for all the meetings, you're seeking God, you're praying, you're, you're keeping too many rules. There is only one reason why you do it and that's because you love God. But if you're doing it because it's the rule of the church or you're trying to please the saints or you're trying to win God's favor, that becomes faith plus. You must understand that to be justified by God, God requires faith. What about repentance? Do you need to repent to be saved? Of course you need to repent. But that repentance is not your work and you're not earning your salvation. God doesn't justify you because you repent. Your repentance is a natural consequence of being convicted of sin. You're not doing it to earn something. You are justified not because you repent, but you're justified by your faith in Christ. Maybe you confessed your sins to some servant of God. You're not justified because of that. That didn't justify you. Please understand that the one and only reason that you're justified is because of your faith in Christ. Another way we practice faith plus is by trying to do a lot of things to forgive people, trying to love people, trying to be faithful, 
by our own efforts. You know, we are really trapped. It's a curse to be trapped in this terrible state. The voice that Luther heard was, the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Listen carefully. The just shall live by faith. Who is this just? This just is the one who has been justified by faith. There is absolutely no way we can be just before God except through faith in Christ. When we have, have faith in Christ, God declares us just. So we are that just. And that just person, the one who has been justified by faith, he should now live by faith. If you want to know that, please listen to two messages. That is the just shall live by faith. And also the message on Galatianism. If you're interested, it will make you understand this concept a little more. So, we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Now, that is faith plus. Now, the another, another way how Satan can corrupt this truth is faith minus. What is faith minus? Another word for this is Sandemanianism. Sandemanianism is named after a sect within Christianity which started in 1730 in Scotland and its leader was Robert Sanderman. And he said this. He said, you don't need to have any emotion. You don't need to have any feeling towards God. You don't even need to have an act of the will for your salvation. You don't even need conviction of sin. All you need to say is, I believe in Jesus. And then that's it, you're saved. And just by that, you can even be presented spotless. No conviction. He says, you can't judge a person because the Holy Spirit is working in his heart. God is working. So if you just say, I believe in Jesus. This is how so many false converts have been produced in many churches. So let me ask you, are you a Sandemanian? Meaning, you claim you are saved because you said, I believe in Jesus. That's all. But there was nothing that accompanied that faith. It's a dead faith. A faith without works is dead. This Andamanianism spread around England and USA, but it died quickly. Do you know why? Because its followers, they had no love for God. They just said they have faith. The tragedy of today's church is that many have drifted away from the gospel. Really, really, this is a terrible tragedy and we have minimized its teaching and its importance. So is it possible that John Huss and Martin Luther and St. Paul and John Wesley and the Moravian brethren who so passionately taught this truth and even gave up their lives for it, is it possible that they were all wrong? Is it possible that they were just exaggerating its importance, overstating its importance. So in the final analysis, it was just a storm in a teacup. What we need to understand as I close is this. The doctrine of justification by faith has been given by God to us as a PDF document. There is no amending it. There is no editing it. There is no adding. There is no removing. Any attempt to modify this doctrine does not just dilute it or even pollute it. It annihilates it. That's how serious it is. Like the Japanese Sandon balance. I don't know if you have seen that. The Japanese Sandon balance. A man he takes the rib of a palm tree, just that central part of the palm leaf, and he places a feather at the end. Have you seen that? He places a feather at the end. Then he takes another palm rib, he places it in the middle strategically. Then he takes another palm rib, he places it crisscross, and he places 13 palm ribs in a crisscross pattern until he's built this huge structure. And the final palm rib, he balances it in the middle and then he lets go of the whole thing. It just stands. And everybody says, wow, look, all the, everything is standing. But that's not the climax. 
the climax is he says do you realize the critical balance of the structure the climax is he goes to the feather he just lifts the feather and the entire structure collapses he says this feather was balancing the whole thing just move that that is how this doctrine of justification is you change one little dot in the doctrine of justification by faith alone it collapses i'll state luther's words and finish luther said the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the chief article of all christian doctrine it is the king and the lord and the ruler of all doctrines if you have understood this properly you will understand every other doctrine correctly final statement but if your understanding of justification by faith alone is wrong then you will get all doctrines wrong and you will never enjoy a proper christian life may god therefore help us as we continue to study this vital truth that god may help us open our eyes that it may not just be added to the collection the library in our head but that this might really penetrate our hearts to help us live according to this beautiful truth god is restoring this beautiful truth in our midst may god therefore help us who are so privileged to hear this that it might not just become another message that we've heard and we mentally assent to and say yeah i heard it i know and then we move on to our life you know that really 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 is a stab in the heart of god may god therefore help us to give ourselves to this teaching to take time to study it to understand it like luther did till it explodes in an ecstatic experience that we may truly be able to enjoy our christian life shall we praise god praise the o god praise the o god praise the o god praise the o god praise